Good evening and welcome to ECISD Live. My name is Scott Murie and I'm the superintendent of Ector County Independent School District. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, each of you to tonight's show. We have a, a very timely topic tonight. It seems like it's a topic we've, we've probably talked a lot about uh, for the last several months. COVID-19 is our topic tonight and we're gonna kind of dive into uh, our school district and specifically what are we doing to make sure that we're keeping our students safe, our staff members safe, and uh, talk about our processes, systems, procedures, and give you a chance to ask questions. And we've got a couple special guests with us tonight that'll add quite a bit of context to our conversation. Uh, some folks that are on the ground every day uh, working to make sure that, that again, our students and staff members uh, remain safe. But before we get to our COVID-19 conversation, I wanna provide a few updates on the work um, of ECISD, the work of our district. I wanna start with the internet tonight. As, as many of you may know, we had a pretty significant announcement a couple of weeks ago um, about SpaceX. We are uh, the first school district in, in really in the world uh, to partner with SpaceX to bring their satellite constellation, their internet technology to uh, some families in ECISD. We recognized when COVID-19 hit in March that many of our students did not have access to the internet. Either they did not have the internet in their home, no broadband access, or the internet access they had was very unstable and they were not able to maintain connections with our teachers. And so we've put together a variety of different uh, solutions. Um, and so tonight, if we have any families that may not have broadband in your home, you may be watching us tonight on your cell phone using a cell tower is your only connection. But if you don't have broadband in your home, we have some really interesting options available for you today. If you live inside the uh, Odessa city limits, then you can visit the ECISD website. Uh, let us know that you don't have broadband and we uh, can provide that for you due to some uh, philanthropic dollars that we've received uh, that are providing that, that uh, broadband service through June 30th of 2021. If you live outside the city limits and do not have access to broadband again, uh, we invite you to visit the ECISD website, let us know, and we're working on some solutions. We have just received about a thousand uh, MiFi devices, so hotspots, if you will, that will uh, bring broadband to some of our families. So excited to offer that. And then if you live in the Pleasant Farms area, uh, SpaceX and that satellite constellation is gonna be your potential solution. And uh, so we're, we're encouraging those families that live in the Pleasant Farms community to uh, let us know, and we'll be providing that for you again in through June 30th. So lots of opportunities with the internet the final piece is we recognize as a school district that solving the internet crisis in our community today it isn't simply a band-aid solution. We need a long-term solution. So we've been working for months now on looking at all of the different ways that communities across the United States have worked to resolve this issue in their own community. And we've created a task force. We call it the Connector Task Force, C-O-N-N -N, capital E-C-T-O-R, uh, the Connector Task Force, a group of individuals that are working hard with us uh, to explore uh, these new opportunities so that we as a community can leverage uh, internet in our homes. It certainly provides opportunities beyond just education. Uh, the, the Having access to high quality broadband uh, certainly uh, contributes to a growing economy. Our business community takes advantage of that opportunity. Uh, families can look at uh, work opportunities in the home and have access to work locations that are beyond just the city of Odessa and Hector County. Uh, so we're excited to partner with various members of city and county government on this exciting project to bring broadband to uh, Hector County, not only ISD, but, but our community as well. Uh, we, In order to, to really do our work well, uh, we're sending out a survey next week to all of our families to gauge, uh, once again, your level of, of connectivity. Many of you may remember that during the spring, we conducted a survey to gather uh, information about the level of con uh, connectivity that was found within each of our homes. We're doing that same survey again. Uh, we've added a series of questions, and so moms and dads, uh, you can be expecting next week a survey about your level of internet uh, connection within your home environment. We'll have a couple of very specific questions. It's a really short survey, uh, but that will give us some good information on how we can continue to do uh, really good work in this area. So we ask that you pay attention next week to that survey coming your way. You'll receive it on email. You'll receive it through text message. And again, it's a really quick uh, few, couple of question survey, but that information will help us make some smart choices, not only as a school district, but as a community. 
And speaking of um, surveys and connections, uh, we have a different kind of survey that we're conducting this week with our students, uh, and it relates to connections. Uh, research says that when students pre-K through 12th grade are connected uh, to their school, they're connected to their teacher, uh, they feel valued and appreciated when they feel like school is a safe place for them to be, uh, students perform better academically. And we as a school district want to know how our kids are feeling about their current uh, level of school connectedness. Uh, does your child feel safe in our school environment? Uh, does your child have a trusting adult on campus with whom they can confide? Uh, does your uh, child feel uh, valued and appreciated uh, on campus? A lot of uh, different questions that we're asking our students today because we wanna make sure that every child in ECISD is connected to their school. So your child may have, have told you this week that they're participating in a, in a survey. The company that we're using is called Panorama. And so if your child has said, hey, mom I, or dad, I filled out the Panorama survey today, uh, that is something uh, that we're using to simply gauge how our kids are feeling uh, about their current school environment. There are also questions in there related to COVID-19. And we know that, that COVID has created some unusual feelings for our children. And we wanna make sure that we're able to address those and so again, uh, that survey is happening right now and, and, and parents, your kids are currently engaged in that survey uh, about how your children feel like their connection is with our school. All right, speaking of some unusual circumstance, uh, circumstances, I wanna uh, kind of turn our attention tonight on COVID-19 and, and the current pandemic situation that we're all dealing with and talk a little bit about how that's affecting ECISD. Um, as many of you know, uh, we, uh, on March 5th of 2020, so months ago, uh, was the, uh, the day that our children left ECISD and went off on spring break. And on March 6th, our staff members uh, finished a, that final day of work and then headed off to enjoy a nice week-long and well-deserved spring break. During spring break, we were notified uh, that the state of Texas had concerns about school districts returning because of COVID-19. And and from that point forward, our world has really changed. Uh, we had a group of people that came together quickly and, and created some remote learning experiences for kids. Our teachers uh, really assembled themselves, our administrators uh, working to create um, solutions for uh, the 34,000 children that we were serving at the time. But last spring was incredibly challenging um, in, in a remote environment. While we didn't have to worry about COVID-19 in our school settings because we didn't have children at school. Uh, we Our concern at that point was just providing a quality academic experience uh, for each of our children and making sure that we remain safe at the same time. Then over the summer, we, we knew that we were gonna have an opportunity to see our kids again and listening to our teachers and principals, you know, even they uh, underscored how important it was that, that they have FaceTime with kids. The spring taught us a lot that, that virtual learning while it is certainly good for some of our children and we want to continue that for for some of our kids it also proved to be pretty detrimental uh, to another group of our kids and it, it's critically important that the kids have access to their teachers and our teachers wanted to have access to kids so we began putting a a variety of, of safety protocols in place we first assembled a, a really large task force the task force divided themselves up among into 18 different subcommittees and each of these 18 subcommittees had a very specific area of focus as we thought about how to safely open our school. And we put a, a variety of different safety measures in place as we reviewed uh, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, we reviewed their recommendations uh, for schools and large organizations. Uh, we reviewed uh, the state of Texas and the, gu the guidance that was provided uh, by the state. <clears throat> we listened to the guidance provided by the Texas Education Agency, TEA, uh, provided not only um, some requirements, but they also provided some recommendations. And so we uh, researched each of those and ensured that we were in compliance with the requirements and that we reviewed the recommendations and made decisions that were smart for our own community. And then and most importantly, we, we worked with our local medical community. Um, our own doctors, uh, the health department, um, the, the CEOs of, of both hospitals here in the city of Odessa, um, our mayor, our, our county judge, a variety of individuals began to meet weekly to talk about COVID-19 and, and our response. And so in putting all of the, the wisdom of those individuals together, we created as a school district um, a path forward 
Uh, how can we educate kids in a safe environment and ensure that our kids are safe? And then how can we um, uh, ensure that, that a quality instruction occurs in that safe environment? How can we make sure that our staff members, our teachers, our nurses, counselors, administrators are all safe as we support our kids? And, um, and so we've done a lot of things that, that we, uh, based upon data, we know are working. Um, and, and so I'll, I wanna kind of share with you a, a list of the things uh, that we put in place and things that we continue to monitor today with our schools. Some of these are very visible. You see some of these and others of these you may not be aware of, but we wanna bring them to your attention tonight. The very first and most important thing is every day, um, every staff member, the 4,200 employees of ECISD, we self-screen. We ask ourselves a series of questions. And if, if we are answered to any of those questions, is cause for alarm or cause for concern, then we don't come to work. Uh, we contact our supervisor, we let them know that we're, we're displaying a symptom. Maybe we have an elevated fever or a temperature, or maybe we're, we have a scratchy throat. Maybe we, are, uh, we have some symptom that is related to COVID-19. And so we self-screen each day as staff members, and we ensure that we do not come to work if indeed we're showing any symptoms. We contact our supervisor and let our supervisor know. And then we follow the process. Uh, we have a pretty, in fact, I'll show you that online in just a few minutes, but we have a protocol that our employees follow should they display any symptoms. For students, we do the same thing. Uh, you as parents know, every day you, you ask your kid a series of questions, you check their temperature, you look for any unusual behaviors, any signs or symptoms of COVID-19, and, and you as a parent, keep your child at home. If they're displaying any symptoms, you take your child to the doctor. Uh, you might quarantine your child if you feel they've been exposed to COVID-19. Um, and, and we appreciate the, 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 uh, the cooperation that we've had from moms and dads and guardians all across our county to make sure that our sick kids remain at home, um, our staff members who are sick remain at home. So that's the, the first and most important thing we do every day is that self-screening uh, to ensure that sickness remains out of our buildings and then the building envelope itself, the school, remains as safe as it possibly can be. Uh, we greet our staff members and students every day with hand sanitizer. Uh, when you walk into almost every entrance of a building, you'll, you'll be welcomed by hand sanitizer. In fact, in many of our schools, there are human beings, people uh, that are at the front of the school, literally squirting hand sanitizer in the hands of our kids uh, daily. And, uh, and so that occurs. But hand sanitizer is available in every classroom, in every area, our restrooms, hallways, and at the entrance of every school. So we use a lot of hand sanitizer. In fact, we have thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer uh, that we own. Hand washing is something that we've done. You'll find this interesting. Not only have our elementary teachers educated our students in um, how to wash their hands correctly, but actually this year, middle school and high schools also uh, received hand washing lessons from teachers. Uh, we were, one of the requirements of the Texas Education Agency this year is that we educate all students in how to appropriately wash their hands. Uh, in fact, a, a person that works very close to me in my office talked about her granddaughter and how her granddaughter every day uh, uses those hand washing techniques that she learned at school and she is the age of four. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. So we do that. Uh, masks, we require all students grades four through 12 uh, to wear masks every day. Uh, we strongly recommend that uh, our pre-K through third grade students wear a mask. Our, the medical guidance that we've received from our medical community, they advised us that our pre-K through third grade students, we should not require them to wear a mask, but encourage them to do that. And so we, we use that guidance and have implemented that in our system. And then our fourth graders, again, through 12th graders, wear them every day, uh, all day, except when they're eating um, or except when they are outside and are able to social distance. We do not require mask usage at that time. From a staff perspective, uh, not every staff member in ECISD uh, wears a mask um, at, at all appropriate times. I am sitting in my office right now and there's nobody in here with me. Um, and this is a time that we are, uh, that I do not wear a mask when I'm in an office. So any of our staff members that are by themselves, uh, whether it's a teacher in a classroom or an administrator in an office, uh, we do not wear a mask. But anytime we are around other people, as soon as we leave an office or in a hallway, walking down the hallway, everybody is required to wear a mask. And then anytime we come in contact with children, in addition to a mask, all staff members will wear a face shield. And so many times if you've, if you've seen uh, maybe pictures or if you've been in any of our schools, you probably have seen teachers and administrators and others that are around children wearing both a face shield and a mask. In fact, today, we uh, five of our trustees uh, visited one of our middle schools and each of them had on a, a mask and a face shield as we were uh, in visiting with some of our teachers and students in classrooms today. Um, so masks are again required uh, for, all, for uh, all staff members and then for students. Um, 
we uh, looking down the list uh, movement we created master schedules this year that limit the movement of our students around campus uh, in fact you'll find that we do not uh, serve lunch in our cafeterias uh, we limit uh, the, the, that type of student movement we do not want our kids to congregate in large areas and so we deliver lunch uh, to classrooms right now um, and so again, and master schedules were designed to limit movement. You'll find in many of our schools that hallway movement is one way. And traditionally, kids are moving in both directions as they travel up and down a hallway. But many of our schools have transitioned hallways into one-way hallways. So all the kids are traveling in the same direction. Again, that helps avoid uh, passing of the virus uh, should they be in the hallway. Um, our custodial staff uh, have added quite a bit of additional responsibility um, to, to their plates this year. So in addition to the regular cleaning that our custodial staff has done, they now clean multiple times every day, high touch areas. So doorknobs um, that are a part of the entrance and exit to a school building, uh, handrails are cleaned uh, multiple times and disinfected each day. Uh, within every classroom, teachers have uh, cleaning materials, um, uh, paper towels and um, disinfectant that they uh, use on a regular basis. Manipulatives that children use in the class are cleaned after each use. Um, kids are distanced in the state in in our classrooms. Uh, in some classrooms, you will not find kids that are six feet apart. The guidance that we receive uh, from the state of Texas is uh, six feet when feasible. But sometimes, because we have we have quite a few kids returning to school, it is not feasible to. Uh, or even not possible to put kids uh, more than six feet apart. And so in some of our classrooms, you'll find kids that are closer together. But, but I, but our teachers have thought pretty creatively about even if they're closer together, how they, they maintain uh, as much distance as possible in those classroom environments. Um, so I commend, but, but a lot of uh, good work on the part of our custodial staff to make sure that the places are disinfected, high touch areas and teachers are doing, um, and, and kids are participating in this too, making sure that those high touch areas in classrooms and, and manipulatives and tools that they're using um, are, are being cleaned. And then um, anytime we, at, at the end of every school day, our uh, custodial staff, we've provided uh, this year some really interesting new uh, cleaning equipment, um, some disinfecting machines that our custodial staff and others are using at the end of every day to make sure that that once again, uh, places are, uh, schools are disinfected um, with our kids. In addition to, to that, we deep cleaned uh, every building on campus uh, with, a co with a company called Germblast. So not only was it cleaned, but they actually used um, uh, an antibacterial and antiviral uh, treatment in each of our buildings uh, during the month, or excuse me, during the week of Thanksgiving. While we, while your children are not in school, that company is actually coming back again. So every building, not only our schools, but every building uh, that we um, that we serve will be cleaned again by germ blast. So every nook and cranny cleaned, and then um, they will treat uh, with uh, antibacterial, antiviral in all of our buildings as well. And then we'll do that once again during the spring semester, again, making sure that those buildings are cleaned. Um, we also phased in, as, as many of you know, and we're still in, the, in, in our phase in process. Uh, the first day of school for ECISD was August 12th. We served 34,000 children, but on August 12th, only 4,200 children came to school that first day. And the reason for that is because we wanted to slowly bring our children back. We wanted to make sure that the systems and processes we have in place were effective. We wanted to make sure that any virus that was in our community, that we were able, that we felt confident that we could handle uh, any kind of outbreak that may uh, occur within our community. Um, and so we phased in our students uh, once every two weeks and that has worked really well for us. Uh, it's, right now we're in the middle of phase six um, and phase six started last week. We brought our uh, seventh graders and 10th graders uh, back in. And so our, our schools now, m most of our students are back in session. Um, right now, because of COVID-19, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but because of uh, the rise in COVID-19 and the current uh, elevated levels in our community, we are looking at phase seven and may uh, have to make some different decisions as we think about uh, moving, transitioning into phase seven. Um, so I'd encourage people to, um, to, to pay attention to any announcements that may be forthcoming as, as, as our continuation with phase seven uh, is concerned. And then finally, one additional piece that I would like to add tonight, and this is new for everybody, uh, the state of Texas uh, last week announced an opportunity for school districts uh, to incorporate testing. And we uh, volunteered for that opportunity. So next week, ECISD will, will receive 10,000 
um, COVID-19 rapid tests. And these uh, tests are pretty interesting. It's a brand new test. Uh, it is, you actually administer the test yourself if you're an adult or a high school student. It is a self-administered test. It is a nasal swab, uh, but not quite like the, uh, the current PCR tests that are used in our hospitals. So not as evasive as some of the other tests, but the accuracy rate is at 97%. So we're very excited about this particular test. It is a quick test, which means you get your results between three and 15 minutes. Uh, again, next week we will have those tests and we're gonna start phasing in our usage of those tests. The first group of people that we'll start with will be our staff members. And so any staff member during the school day that demonstrates um, any symptoms, any COVID-19 symptoms, uh, those staff members will have an opportunity to, uh, to take that test, uh, administer it them themselves. And, uh, and then with, within just a few minutes, we'll have the results of that test and then we can follow up appropriately. So if the staff member tests positive, then of course that staff member would uh, be sent home and quarantined. And if the, task, if the staff member tests negative, while they still may go home because they don't feel well, at least we'll know that it's not COVID-19. Once we are comfortable with that testing process with our staff members, then we will begin to transition it to students. And so during the school day, any student that displays COVID-19 symptoms, we will have that testing opportunity available for kids. Um, and we will need, of course, parent permission. So a parent, you would be notified if, if indeed your child, just like you're notified today, if your child displays any symptoms, uh, we would notify you. We would ask if you would like your child to be tested at school, and then we would conduct that test. Um, if your child is elementary or middle, if they're a high school student, they would conduct it themselves. And then we would know within just a few minutes if indeed the child is uh, test positive for COVID-19. And if indeed is a positive test, then we would uh, be able to immediately respond to that and we would quarantine the child and then we'd able, be able to deal with any other exposure that may have occurred on campus. So we're excited about this testing opportunity. Uh, we know that it will help us become more focused in, in dealing with the outbreak that is occurring in our community. And then all of those uh, results will be reported to our health department and we will report those results on our uh, ECSD dashboard as well. So uh, lots of safety procedures happening um, in school and lots of good things. I, I wanna kind of transition now. I've got a couple of really uh, unique people in the wings right now, and, and I'll call these individuals experts. One is clearly a medical expert and the other is an expert in this business we call education. And so I wanna, I wanna invite my guests right now and I wanna start with, with our nurse. So tonight we have Ali Hernandez with us. Ali is one of the nurses that we have in Ector County Independent School District. We are fortunate in ECISD uh, that the students in our schools have access to uh, nurses. And when I say Allie is a nurse, she's not a nurse just because we call her a nurse. She's actually a licensed nurse. Um, and you don't find this everywhere. Not every school district in the state of Texas provides access to nurses on campus for children, but we do in ECISD. And so Allie, um, First of all, thank you for joining us tonight, and, uh, and we appreciate you being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself first. So you're a nurse where? What schools do you serve? Um, I am the school nurse at Reagan and Ross Elementaries. Um, I have been at Reagan, I think this is my 14th or 15th year now there. Oh, yes. And I've been at Ross, I think now my sixth or seventh year. So you've been with the district for quite a few years. Yes, sir. Good, yes, good, sir. good. So COVID-19 has probably rocked your world as a nurse. It has. <laughs> yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about that. What, what, what is life like right now for you as a nurse serving our elementary schools? Busy, very busy. So um, in the mornings, you know, normally you, you go in, you start getting set up, um, get your clinic set up, get the eyes, chest ready, whatever, these kinds of things. But now it's go in um, and if you're lucky, you'll get to walk in and get your stuff put down before you start getting bombarded with phone calls from um, either staff members or um, parents. And it's usually COVID related questions or mm -hmm. maybe um, a student is sick and they're not sure you know, do I send them to school? Do I not send them to school? And we really appreciate it when parents call. If you're not sure, stay home and call us and let us know. And, um, you know, we're more than happy to guide you through that because we'd rather do that than have a kiddo come to school and be sick and expose others there. 
But yep. um, so we spend a you know a good portion of our day now just um, talking with staff and parents about COVID related questions. Either their students are exposed or they're positive, or maybe somebody in the family has been ex uh, exposed or positive themselves. Yep. And um, so we, you know, each individual call, we just, um, we go through a series of questions. Um, everybody's circumstances are different. And so sure. then that's how we determine the course of action after that. So let's, let's talk about that, Ali. So you are, you arrive at school and you are notified that a child has tested positive for COVID-19. What, what happens? Um, we, well, again, we have to talk to the parents and we right. have to find out um, a, a bunch of information. We've got a slew of questions we ask. And that's because we have to know uh, different things like when symptoms started, um, when they tested positive, everything is about um, a timeline. There's, there's, during this timeline, there's times when they're the most contagious. Mm -hmm. And um, there are time, there's that time frame two days before they even start symptoms that they're contagious. So trying to find out if they were on campus during those two days. And if they were, um, it's a lot of contact tracing, trying yep. to find out who may have been exposed to that student. And, you know, were, was there a six foot distance? Um, were were they wearing masks if the staff was wearing a mask and a shield, you know, so we, we have to go looking at seating charts that the teachers provide us to find out who was sitting around the student. And we, so is there a lot of investigation so sure. that we can contact all those close contacts and yep. notify them that they also need to quarantine. And yep. if they are at school during the time, because, you know, sometimes test results take a little while to come back. Yep. And so when, if they are at school at the time, then we do have to ask the parents to go ahead and come pick up their exposed students. Mm -hmm. And then um, we go through the process of trying to decide for how long they need to quarantine. Um, typically quarantine is 14 days from the last date of exposure. Yep. However, it depends on, there's a lot of other individual factors that are involved. And unfortunately, some kids are quarantined for 24 days and sometimes even more. And, and I, uh, we understand that is, that is hard on a family, uh -huh. very hard on a family. But, um, you know, keep in mind, we're doing this to help protect our students, our staff and our community. Uh, absolutely. And, and so thank you for that. I mean, that, that's a great explanation. Talk about... Um, notification. So when you mentioned contact tracing, and just to remind everybody, and some people may not have heard that phrase before, but you know, when, when you're notified, what, what, what does contract tracing mean to you? What, what does that look like in action in your school environment? So um, like I said, we do have to get seating charts, especially for the older grade levels from mm -hmm. teachers to see who was sitting around the students because the older grade levels are wearing masks or should be wearing masks all day. So um, the students that are closest to them are the ones that are gonna be quarantined for the most part. The younger grade levels, they're not wearing masks. So generally the entire class has to be quarantined. Yep. Um, and in, it's not just at, at school too, you know, lunch, who did they have lunch with? Um, if it's a staff member, who did they have lunch with? And how far apart were they and, you know, staff we have meetings and things like that where we were where we keeping that six foot distance where we wearing our masks like we were supposed to all those things come into play and then also for um children extracurricular activities what are they doing before and after school do they ride the bus back and forth home you know who are they sitting near on the bus um are they in other type uh, other extracurricular like classes, like GT classes. So some of these kids, they're transported to another campus for GT classes. Yep. And, or even if they're on the same campus, they're with a different group of kids. And so those kids might be exposed and affected. So we we have to look at the, in, the child's entire day. Yep. So 
talk, talk about notification for a minute. So, you, so when you do your contact tracing, you, you know, you find out a child has tested positive um, and you contact trace and you find out that some children or staff members <clears throat> meet the definition of exposure. What, what does their contact look like? If the, I'm sorry, if the, a, a child, they, they meet the definition of exposure. They have been exposed. Yeah. What does that contact, what does that contact look like? Okay. So they have to be within six feet for a cumulative 15 minute time frame. And it does not, a cumulative means it does not have to be 15 straight minutes. Within a 24 hour period, if they have contact within six feet and especially without a, a mask, then it's one minute here, two minutes there, five minutes there within a 15 minute period. I yeah. mean, 24 hour period, I'm sorry. Yeah. So that's, that's considered a close contact. Yeah. And that is and that is the definition of contact that we, close contact that we use from the Center for Disease Control, also the Texas Education Agency, even our own local medical community, all of those agree on that definition of close contact. So that's what we use as a school district. Um, you know, I'm not the medical professional. Allie tonight is the medical professional uh, on this call, thank goodness. And, um, and so I, so that's the right call. What about parent notification, Allie, or just notification in general? So when you do find out that somebody has kind of meets the definition, who notifies uh, those individuals? Um, the nurses are doing a lot of the notifications. I know on my campuses though, um, my staff there is, they're awesome. And they do help me with that. My principals, mm -hmm. um, in fact, my, principal uh last week she she rocks she said you know what don't worry about it i've got this i'll take care of it and she did yeah. all that so it just Good. it you know it depends i i'm i'm blessed i have i work with wonderful people so they help me out yeah, good. And then everyone else, I think that's part. So those people that are directly exposed receive a personal notification, you know, whether it's a call from the nurse or someone else on staff, but they're personally notified. If it's a student, then the, the parents are notified. And if it is a staff member, who, who notifies a staff member on your campus? Do you do that as the nurse or does somebody else do that? Um, I generally will notify my staff members because okay. um, we, and I think uh, I'm pretty sure all the other nurses are doing the same thing because yeah. we want to make sure they are meeting those um, protocols to return back to work as well. Got and it. then not only that, again, we're trying to figure out even with staff, who have they been around? Who do we need to quarantine staff wise also? And yeah. then we have to notify them yeah. and then, of course, educate the staff to watch out for symptoms of COVID and what to do. Yeah if they do experience those. And then everyone else, you know, this is the, these are the phone phone calls that happen every night, you know, um, for everyone else that is not directly exposed. If you are a, if you're, if it happens at your school, that's the phone call that people are receiving at night. And the, that is just notification that someone at your school or someone in your building um, tested positive and uh, you were not exposed because you're just getting this robo call, if you will, um, or email. But uh, those people that are directly exposed and meet the definition of exposure, they have a personal phone call, either from a nurse or from somebody else on campus. Um, so good information. I know that, that some of our schools um, are issuing now a lot of phone calls because they have a lot of kids. So I wanna transition. Thanks, Allie, I'm gonna come back to you in a few minutes, but I wanna transition to our next guest who is making a lot of phone calls right now. And that is uh, the principal of Permian High School, uh, Dr. Delisa Stiles. So uh, Dr. Stiles, Hey, how are you doing this evening? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. Doing very well. I see uh, you haven't made it home today. You're you're still sitting <laughs> at the Permian High School uh, principal's office. <laughs> That's right. I Burning the midnight oil again. There you go. Um, Happy so, to be here. Good. Well, we thank thank you for for uh, joining us tonight. Um, and we were just talking about notification. You know, Delisa, you have 4,000 students and about 350 staff members on your campus. And talk to us about notification and phone calls. What, what does that process look like for you? Because you've, you've been making a lot. <laughs> well, we have shared that we're a community within a community. So we try to support one another as best we can. But yes, to your point, there is a lot of protocols that we follow because, um, 
we have the student aspect of this, and then we have the faculty aspect of it. So I'm very grateful that I have a well-informed team from the minute we find out that we have a positive case mm -hmm. or a student that um, may be tested positive, and as a result, we have to have other members quarantined. There's a protocol that's followed naturally, yep. and it all starts with our beloved nurses. So I'm so glad I'm sharing time tonight with Allie just to kind of express appreciation to nurses everywhere. Um, just, I, I don't know what we would do without our two nurses here at Permian, but it more or less starts with them. And then obviously we follow a, a protocol of notification. And obviously our first um, outreach is the uh, students and our faculty members and contacting parents. And then on the operations side of that, just making sure that we have the rooms taking care of any place the student might have been. I don't want to reiterate the um, stories that Allie's already shared tonight about that process, but it's a very defined protocol. And yep. at the end of the day, when we have uh, tallies, we want to make sure that we uh, communicate back out to our stakeholders to be as transparent as possible about the number of cases we have. We don't want to call them throughout the day with every single case. So we do try to consolidate at least to one daily message. And there have been a few days here and there that we haven't had to make a call. So every day that we don't make a call, we're very grateful. Yeah, I, I think it's important, especially at, at um, Odessa High School and Permian High School, because you have such a large amount of human beings. You know, both of you have r almost 4,500 human beings, you know, that you serve between children and adults. Um, you have you have a lot of folks, and um, and so the number of calls that you're going to make at your high school is going to be significantly more than what we might see at another school, simply because you serve more children and and have more adults on campus. And as we've seen the numbers rise in our community, you know we have seen the number of positive cases uh, rise within our own schools, and so therefore the the phone calls have increased. Um, talk about what from a safety perspective, uh, Dr. Styles, what what you're seeing on your campus. You know, I, I read through a litany of, of things that we're doing as an organization to keep our staff members and keep our students safe, but um, anything that you would add to that or, or what, what, what does safety look like um, on, on a high school campus right now? What are you seeing? Well, I've been very impressed with our students as they return to the building in campus. I don't know if they're just super excited to be back, but they follow the protocols of wearing their mask or if they need to be reminded. I've been very impressed with the level of respect. Um, if we have a student that may have forgotten the mask, we obviously catch that as they're coming in through the doors in the morning and we have extras for those that may not have a mask, but that happens very infrequent, infrequently, honestly. Um, to your point, we as employees, we wear the mask and shields and that is a muscle that we've all had to get better and develop, but we're learning to do a lot of new things now. And yep. um, the students have been advised and coached to make sure that they're on one side of the hallway. I can't go so far as to say at Permian with the number of students we have that we could make it one way, <laughs> but they're very good at two way. They stay on their side of the hallway. And um, as far as um, using the hand sanitizer. We have that in many, many stations. There are breakfasts and lunches. We may talk about that a little bit more, but it's grab and go. Um, a lot of safety protocols in place there as well. We want to, the kids to obviously have bottled water since our water fountains are closed. Yep. So um, I just want to recognize our hardworking uh, school nutrition team as well, because they have done an amazing job of making sure that not only that are they providing water and breakfast, but the meals are hot. Um, I've, I've just been very impressed with the type of food that the, the kids are served and um, overall just doing an outstanding job. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it is, I think, you know, everybody, when you think about, you know, all of the roles and that, that you see people taking on from bus driver to cafeteria worker to teacher to administrator, you know, that it, it, it's, uh, you know, we have superhuman individuals in our school districts that are going extra miles. I, you know, Delisa, you can relate to this. I had a, a conversation with a principal today and uh, because of COVID-19 and the they had several student cases today. And, and from a protocol perspective, as soon as we know that um, either a student or staff member has tested positive, we remove the kids from that space 
and then the space is is deep cleaned. Um, and so at this particular middle school, it meant that there were multiple uh, classes that had to go to the cafeteria, the gymnasium, the library. So the large spaces on campus were filled with classrooms because the classroom space had all been contaminated. And so our cleaning crews had to go in and and make sure those are safe spaces. Have you all, from a space perspective, you know, Dr. Stiles, have you had to deal with anything like that on your campus? <laughs> yes, uh, but I've just been very impressed with the problem solving and teamwork. Uh, we're all doing things in real time, learning sometimes as we go, but um, sometimes our students have to be moved to different locations depending on where our uh, operations team needs to come in and disinfect. So yes, we just creatively use spaces that um, are open. And I will say that the staff has been very accommodating of each other and helping and maybe a teacher's classroom for whatever reason has more remote students that day. So we fluctuate in and out. We definitely utilize our cafeteria, um, just all types of flex spaces, always just anywhere that we need to gravitate to in a school this size. At least we do have pockets and thankfully the weather has been beautiful. So we've been able to, for the most part, capture those days and take advantage of being outside when possible. So, yep. yeah. We're fortunate to live in a place that we have some decent weather right now. So outside is is a real possibility for our folks. That's good. Um, Ms. Hernandez, I want to come back to you and, and talk about the human side of this. You know, part of being a nurse, you certainly deal with the, the medical conditions that come your way. Uh, related to COVID-19 is sometimes unrelated to COVID-19, but but you probably also deal with with the the emotions that that are uh, being expressed by kids and parents and, and and staff members. So, what's the human side of COVID-19 like right now in your schools? Stressful. <laughs> it's very stressful. I mean, it's very busy. It's nonstop. Um, we're having to do things so much differently this year. So there was a lot of just uh, adjustments that had to be made. Yeah. I mean, just the way we see kids um, on like we would on a normal day to day basis, it has to be completely different now. Um, we have to keep them completely separated. You know, the well, we've got the kids coming in, they're still coming in for their medications and their treatments and their procedures. Yeah. We have to keep them totally separated from everybody else because we don't know. Um, it's, it's a lot more time consuming um, to do things the way we're doing it now, but I mean, it is what it is. We have to do what we have to do to keep uh, our students safe. And um, it's, I think, I feel like most of us are probably getting COVID fatigue. You know, it took us all a while to adjust to all the, to the mask and the face shield. Those face shields are not easy to see through. <laughs> and um, it, it starts, everything starts getting hot after a while, but I mean, we're getting adjusted. Um, things change all the time and they change really quickly. So being able to adjust to new protocols from one day to the next yeah. can be a little daunting, but um, we're, we're getting, I mean, we're, we're, we're making it happen. And I feel like that, um, you know, if we just continue to work together, um, that we'll get through this together. And yeah. I do feel like that um, I've seen a lot of, of that this year, us working together, like helping each other out so much yeah. more than yeah. we, I mean, not that we didn't help each other out before, but I feel like we go the extra mile this right. year. Yeah, I would agree. We use a phrase often, and you see this in ECISD, we do this work together. And I think that, that I, when you look at what's happening in our organization, there is a whole lot of together right now because you know, we all realize that, that none of us can do this work by ourselves. And I even think as we think about our families too, you know, you know, from last spring throughout the summer and into the fall, um, I, I think our, 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 our moms and dads you know, realize how important it is to connect with the child's teacher. And certainly as a school, we recognize how important it is that parents are fully engaged in the education of their child. So it, it is a together thing right now. Um, and nice to see that. Dr. Faust, what about you? Um, the human side of this, what, what, what is life like right now? What are the feelings and emotions on a high school campus? Well, to Ali's point, there's a lot that people are juggling, just handling the work-life balance sometimes that teachers have taken on since we first had to be quarantined 
back last spring, I know that they do a lot once they leave work here and it trickles sometimes into their lives at home when they're still taking attendance or reaching back out to the students. So I can't say enough about their work ethic. Um, just we've tried to make sure that we supported them as much as we can from an administrative standpoint, but um, kudos to everyone, including our staff, kids, parents. We all are learning so, so much um, in real time. And I know that the work that they're doing is very hard. I see daily when I'm in their classrooms, the balance that they're trying to manage between their virtual learners versus their face to face. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I want people to understand that those aren't two different populations. Our teachers are juggling those in real time. Yep. Uh, we started out thinking, oh, we'll have a remote class and then we'll have some teachers that have face to face kids. And that was dissolved very quickly just due to scheduling. So teachers will literally be talking to the, their remote audience and then turn and address their face to face kiddos. So um, as administrators, we try to model that and we have Zoom meetings and it keeps us humble because we're we realize just in a short meeting with with our team how hard that is yeah it's keeping yep. everyone engaged and uh, try to keep adults from multitasking while you're trying to share something important and it, it just reminds yep. us of our audience is captured and they have to be in there with us but it's not necessarily that way with students yeah no you're absolutely right you know we even see that uh, to your point even in our own adult meetings sometimes <laughs> we see people straying so you're exactly right um, hey, ladies, got got a couple of questions that are coming in. I want to hit some of these, and some of these maybe for you, Ms. Hernandez. Let me let me kind of come to you with with this first one. Um, so, the question is: How is it possible that a school still accepts a child, even though that somebody in their family is quarantined? And so, the family member is not tested positive; they're just in quarantined. And so, would we allow that child to come to school? Um, now, if the child was exposed, then they should be quarantined at home. They shouldn't be at school. If the situation if, is no, no one if, at home is tested positive. Well, okay. So if somebody at home was exposed, yes, then yes. the child might be a secondary exposure. Yeah, correct. And if they are a secondary exposure, then they can return to school as normal. However, if their exposed family members start exhibiting symptoms or do test positive or go to get tested, even if they're going to go get tested, they yeah. need to keep the kid home because, um, you know, if you're going to get tested, you're, you're assuming that you might have COVID and therefore everybody in the house should quarantine until those test results are received and further guidance is given. But if it's just like mom and dad were exposed, but, the kiddo wasn't there with them and they weren't exposed to that person, then the student is a secondary exposure. So they can still continue to go to school until something different happens with mom and dad. That's a great answer. You know, I think, again, relying on our medical community for this kind of advice is important because sometimes logic of a non-medical person may say one thing, but the medical advice is something we have to listen to. Um, and so that that's great guidance. And all of this, again, is available on the ECISD website, um, but that's that's a good answer to that. So next one, really back to you, Ms. Hernandez, if a teacher tests positive, shouldn't all the students that have that teacher be quarantined? It's gonna depend. That's the reason why the teachers are, are wearing the mask and the face shield. That's like a double barrier. Um, and the teachers are instructed to try. I know teachers have to go around and they do have to help the kids with the, some of their work and things like that. But we encourage them to just make it as quick as possible and try not to be in close contact the whole time with the, the students. Um, but that's the reason for the mask and the face shield is so that we can protect our kids and try to keep them in school. Yeah, that's and that's I think that's probably one of the best answers that, that we really created with our medical community this summer as we're thinking about opening school. It is because 
our teachers and anyone in, around a child, because we wear both a mask and a face shield, we do not have to quarantine the entire class when a teacher tests positive. In fact, that was put to the test the first day of school. We actually had a teacher that tested positive on the first day. And while that teacher had to go home because they were positive you know, with COVID, the students were able to remain um, and that's been good. And we know that that's working because to go back to something you said earlier, um, Ali, you talked about contact tracing. You know, we, our goal is to find out where every single case comes from. And so, Ms. Hernandez, where do most of our cases come from in ECISD, or at least the cases you're familiar with? Yes, majority of our kids are exposed outside of the school. Yep. And there's not, we've not seen a whole lot of um, COVID spread inside the school. It's yep. the majority of the kids are exposed and they're exposed outside the home. And the ones that um, are testing positive, majority of them are, um, they have caught it from outside the home, uh, yep. outside the school. And when you contact Trace, you find out that source and we find out that that source is a family member, a friend or an event that, that a, a, an adult or a child may have attended. So um, no, good answer. Um, the, the question, I guess, is pr probably for me, it's what number do we have to hit before the school shuts down? It's a comp there isn't a number. It's a complex formula, actually, that, that really makes that decision. Um, we, we cannot shut down um, unless we have uh, permission, if you will, from the Texas Education Agency. And they look at hospitalizations. Uh, they talk to local officials, our local medical community. Uh, there are uh, a lot of steps, if you will, that have to be put in place before a school district can, can shut down. Uh, immediately, if we have spread within a school, we can close a school building for a short period of time, up to five days to deal with that. Um, and then um, beyond that, um, we have to, um, you know, consult with the Texas Education Agency. But right now, as we are talking with our own local medical community, it is really listening to their guidance and, and their recommendations. And, and right now, based upon all of the data uh, that we're generating as a school district, uh, they're very confident with the safety procedures that we have in place because our medical community sees the spread through their own contact tracing is happening within our community. And so as long as we can assure that our students and staff members are safe, then we will continue uh, to have school. Um, let's see if a teacher exposed to the student line between us there wearing a mask. Okay, Ali, kind of a, a, a technical question it goes back to something that we just talked about. If a teacher is exposed to a positive student, and so in this case, the student is positive, the teacher, let's make an assumption the teacher has mask and face shield. Um, for longer than 30 minutes, but they are wearing a mask and a face shield, are they still considered exposed? So the student has it, the teacher is, ex or is the teacher exposed? I guess that's the question. So. If the, as long as the teachers are wearing their mask and their face shield, I mean, for the most part, they're probably going to have 30 minutes or more in the classroom with their students because they're in the classroom. For, uh, they're in there all day with them. So, but as long as they have their mask and their face shield, then um, they generally can stay and work. But their students, if you know, if it's a younger grade level, third grade and under, then they the class quarantines, and then the teacher will stay and teach virtually from her classroom. Good, um, Dr. Styles. I'll give you this one. It's about mm -hmm. uh, the virtual learning side of of being quarantined. So, if a child is sick. Uh, can we keep a child at home as long as they want to be online? And so talk about a COVID-19, you, you have a kid face-to-face, -face, they test positive and they're at home. How long can that kid stay at home? Well, that is the beauty, the silver lining of COVID and, and remote instruction. Um, we make sure that we honor if a student is not well, then they can log in and that's the, like I said, uh, been a positive about students being able to keep up with instruction. So if if they've been face to face and they're positive, then they don't have to miss a beat as long as they're feeling well enough to log in, obviously. But we want them to stay on track. And that would probably be the message I would try to communicate as much as possible is whether you're face to face or virtual remote, please, please, we want to see you every day in some capacity. 
um, logging in with us. Our, our teachers miss you when you're not there. No, absolutely. And I think we've seen that, you know, our, while we have some kids experiencing great success in the virtual environment, we have many kids that are that are really struggling in that virtual environment. And to your point, you know, teachers want to see uh, their students. And for many of our kids, that face-to-face -face environment with a great teacher uh, nothing can replace that for many of our kids. And so we, we, we want to get to that place. It's important. Good. Um, so a question, I'm going to actually share my screen. So if we could bring my screen up, uh, a question about where do I find this information? And, and so I want to show everyone where we have much of this information. So right now you're looking at the ECISD website. If you click on back to school, the back to school link takes you to a variety of information and we call it back to school because literally we're not every child because we haven't finished our phases. We still have kids that have yet to return uh, to school. So we're still in that process. Um, but a couple of things that I would point out uh, that are on this list, I'd first point out our COVID-19 dashboard. So we publicly report every single day, we're required to do this, every single case that we have in our district. And so you, you this is updated every day by 530, uh, just like the County Health Department. Uh, so some basic information at the top, you can see when it started. So we started keeping these data on August 5th. So everything is since August 5th, which was the first day of school for teachers uh, and staff members in ECISD. Uh, so today you can see positive staff reports today. Today in ECISD, we had four staff members that reported a positive test. And then today in ECISD, we had 15 students that reported a positive test. So you, again, you can check this every day. If you look down the list, you'll see every single uh, school that is listed. The first one is administrative department. So we put all departments uh, that are not school related in one category. But the rest of this list is, is simply all the schools at ECISD. So you could find your child's school. If your child attends Ross Elementary, you'll see Ross Elementary. And the number one for Ross and one is staff. So at Ross Elementary, they've had one staff member test positive and they've had zero students test positive. And again, updated daily, um, well, you're welcome to access it from the ECISD website. The uh, next thing I would look is information for students and parents. So several people have asked about um, the health and safety uh, situation tonight. So if, you, if you click on uh, cleaning and disinfecting, these are the, the processes and these are things that we're doing in each of our schools. So you can find that out, but also screening and exposure. And this is important. Several questions tonight about uh, being exposed. What is the definition of exposure? What does that look like? And so you can click on this area and specifically parent information, but uh, in both English and Spanish that will tell you specifically about the definition of exposure and then what we do. Um, so all of this information, again, is on the ECISD website. Click on back to school and all of our COVID-19 resources um, are located here. So all the information that you would ever want about COVID-19 and ECISD, uh, you can find um, on this area, including a whole list of questions and answers uh, that we've been collecting since we've started this body of work. So uh, if you're interested, I would uh, I'd encourage you to, uh, to follow through. And one more thing I want to show you while we've got the screen up is another document. So it is important that we as a community are taking really good care of ourselves. And we're going to post this on the ECISD website, but I, we found this fascinating. This is released by uh, the state of Texas and it is a list of um, risky behaviors, if you will, or the level of risk that certain types of behaviors uh, may display when, as we think about COVID-19. So at the top, it starts with low risk behaviors, so basically things that we can do as a community that are fairly safe, uh, playing tennis, camping, um, opening the mail in your house, uh, getting takeout at a restaurant. These are safe things all the way to the other end. Highest risk things, attending a large music concert, going to a sports stadium, attending a religious service with more than 500 people, going to a bar, um, movie theater, amusement parks, working out at a gym, eating at a buffet. These are pretty high risk behaviors. And then you have areas in number seven, uh, playing football, basketball, hugging and shaking hands. So I would encourage our community to pay attention to a list like this. It just helps ensure that, that we are all uh, remaining safe. All right, I wanna wrap this up. First, thank you. Um, 
Ali, and thank you, Delisa, for joining us tonight. Two great experts in very different areas, but today your areas are certainly coming together as we think about the, the health and safety um, of our students and staff members. So thank you for the work that you do every single day uh, to ensure the safety of our kids and to make sure that, that all of our students are well educated. We appreciate both of you. And then finally, thank you, those uh, watching tonight, uh, those that are engaged in our community, to you parents, moms and dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, those of you that support our children from home, uh, we do this work together. And so we ask for your partnership. Uh, when you have concerns, questions, frustrations, make sure that you remain in contact with your child's school so that we can work together uh, to ensure that your child is not only safe, but also receiving the, the quality of education uh, that they should be receiving. And then for members of our community, thank you for uh, the work that you do to continue to support uh, what we are doing with the 34,000 children in ECISD that we serve every single day. We have an incredible staff of 4,200 employees that as you heard tonight are going well above and beyond the call of duty. The work that our people are doing today is incredibly difficult. The level of stress that our teachers feel, our administrators feel, our nurses and counselors, and, and those people that are serving your children, their level of stress today is, is significant uh, because they are trying to balance the safety, ensuring that, that your child is safe, but also wanting to make sure that that we are providing the best possible academic experience for your kids and it creates stress. So I encourage you, the next time you see an ECISD staff member, make sure that you um, you show them uh, the kind of appreciation they deserve for, for a job well done. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, hope you have a good rest of the evening. Stay safe, wear a mask, wash your hands and maintain uh, your distance with other individuals and have a good night.